Hey, everybody. Thank you for downloading episode 143 of We Got This with Mark and Hal. And happy Thanksgiving to you. I know Mark says it at the end of every episode, but I wanted to add my thanks to all of you who listen to the show, who have reviewed us on Apple Podcasts, who share us with all your friends and keep coming back and talking about stuff with us, telling us when we're right, telling us when we're wrong. We really, really appreciate the entire community that's grown up around this show. And more great stuff to come, including SF Sketchfest in January. Tickets are on sale now. You can go to our Twitter account at We Got This Tweets to see our link to tickets. We're going to be doing a live show on January 14th with our special guests Cameron Esposito and Rhea Butcher. That's going to be a double bill with Craig's List, one of our favorite podcasts from fellow Work Juice player Craig Kakowski and Carla Kakowski. And their special guest will be another Work Juice player, Busy Phillips. It's going to be an awesome show, all happening on Sunday, January 14th. Be sure to get your tickets. But for now, please enjoy this very special episode of We Got This with Mark and Hal. Hello, I'm Hal Lublin. And I'm Mark Gagliardi. Since the dawn of humanity, one issue has gone unsettled. With the fate of the world in the balance, we're here to settle once and for all. Best Muppet Show guest. That's right. Don't worry, everyone. We got this. Podcasts should have a theme song. Podcasts should not have a theme song. Yes, they should. No, they shouldn't. They sound good. Yeah, but people are just going to skip past it. Hmm. You know what? You're right. We got this. Thank you for coming to this live taping of We Got This with Mark and Hal. Um, I'm Mark. And I'm Hal. Uh, normally, we uh, our show, uh, if, if you're not familiar with our show, we cover uh, unimportant topics uh, in great detail. But today we're going to do something different. We're going to discuss the world's most important topic. That's right. And that is The Muppet Show. Yes. And we have special guests here to do it. So please welcome back to the stage the president of the Jim Henson Legacy, Mr. Craig Shemin. And our dear friend, uh, best-selling author and Muppet connoisseur, Mr. John Hodgman. Hello. Thank you for being here, fellas. Thank you for having us here. Thank you. It is my pleasure. So we uh, we asked the internet to help us because we decided we wanted to come up with we wanted to find the best Muppet Show episode of all time, mm-hmm. and to do that, uh, we knew there was there were a lot of episodes over several. How many seasons did the Muppet Show? Run? Five seasons, one hundred and twenty episodes. One hundred and twenty episodes. <laughs> oh, I love to find that the library. Yeah, that's just studied. that was information that I always had in my mind. It wasn't just that you mentioned it. <laughs> 25 minutes ago, when you were walking through that amazing exhibit upstairs. Um, so, yeah, when you want to know the truth and get a real answer, the thing you do is pull people on the internet, <laughs> which is what we did. Uh, we, we have, from the 120 episodes, five finalists. These were voted on by hundreds of people, nay, thousands, don't know, don't remember, of people... On the internet, uh, f- uh, via survey that we put up, it was spread all over the place. Uh, so we're only going to be focusing on five episodes. So if you don't hear the one that you like in this episode, it is your fault. So it's important to point out that these finalists are really culled from the selection of people who are likely to take internet polls. Yes. 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 So it, hundreds it, and hundreds of dudes. <laughs> yes. Which is why all five of these episodes uh, are guest hosted by dudes. Yeah. This yeah. is this is troubling to me. It is it's to troubling to me too. Yeah. Because you should all be ashamed of yourselves if you voted. Ha- <laughs> some of its most memorable episodes are are hosted by non dudes. Sure. Yes. And these are five amazing episodes. Yes. And yes. one of them is the best, and I know which one it is. Uh, but we're. For as far as I'm concerned, this will always be an asterisk. Yes. If you don't have Gene Stapleton in there. Yes. So Gene and Stapleton all the other amazing. incredible. Or Julie Andrews, who is another Julie great. Andrews, uh, another another. Person. Ethel Merman, one of Beverly the Sills. Beverly, Beverly Sills. Beverly Sills. Sills. Rita show. Moreno, y'all. Rita Moreno. We're just pointing out Valerie right now Harper that we are apologizing that this mom. is all male yeah. episodes. <laughs> it was not our selection. Uh, no, no. no, but of this selection, the there is there is going to be a winner. And do you want to mention the uh, this? Frank Oz thing. Yes, I I, uh, saw Frank Oz recently and told him we were doing this. And um, I asked him what his selection for the best Muppet show was. And 
Uh, he gave it to me, and it happens to be one of these finalists. He, he, All right. Now, to make things real spicy, I've made a bet with our producer, Ken Plume, who is sitting in the front row. That my choice for the best episode, which I which I had after viewing all five, I said, well, this one clearly uh, is not only the best of these five, but the best that they ever did, is the same as Frank Oz's. We have bet one dollar, which will be presented during this episode when when we reveal, which we'll find out at the end. Yes, I think only to be fair. Yes. Uh, we, so we what wanna... we're gonna do is we're gonna dive I'm right excited in. Excited too. <laughs> Uh, we're going to dive right in and go through these episodes in chronological order, and then we'll start deciding between them. And so, we have little trailers to show to refresh your memories, and the trailers were put together by the lovely Stephanie DeBruzzo. Yes. Thank you, Stephanie. So if you're coming later, uh, we'll be joining us for our second episode That's this right. afternoon. Uh, so from season one, this is episode 24, which aired in April of 1977, hosted by Vincent Price. <laughs> Our guest star is none other than the crown prince of terror, Mr. Vincent Price. So tonight, there will be no craziness, no slapstick, and no silliness. Can I give you a hand? Oh, please. Here. That's my kind of joke. You just fall out my Like I am, you are appalled and shocked at the weird, unnatural things going on tonight. I am the beautiful assistant. Yes, I will. You got Hey, let's give him another hand. Oh no, Kermit, let me give you one. Vincent Price. Uh, well, you might want to explain a little bit about who Vincent Price is for some of the. If you don't know players. who Vincent Price is, he is what do they call him? The Crown Prince of the Macabre, uh, famous for all of his horror movies. So this was very much a horror themed episode of the Muppet Show, beginning with uh, the very first, the opening song right out of the gate: "One Muppet Eats Another Muppet," and then sings, "I've Got You Under My Skin," um, which is. The great leadoff for this episode. Um, what do you got? This is season one. This is one of the early episodes. Obviously. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> because you got the old design for Fozzie, old design yeah. for Miss Piggy. You sound upset about that. I think season one, well, I don't want to, we're not comparing and contrasting. We're only talking about what was good here, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Here's my favorite thing about it. I, I appreciate it that Vincent Price brand strongly associated with old-fashioned horror movies. Mm -hmm. They have to do a lot of monsters and junk, even though Vincent Price was a brilliant actor outside of the horror genre and a wonderful dude. What I love was they even gave him a sec. He was a very famous gourmet cook. Mm -hmm. Vincent Price, it's true. Vincent Price had a huge best-selling book called Cooking with Vincent and his wife, whose name I can't remember at the moment. Uh, and Coral, terrible Coral title Brown. book. Coral, well, yeah, Coral Brown. Coral Brown. And so they even worked in a segment that, that spoke to his gastronomy. There was a talk show segment where Vincent Price gets to say Cordon Bleu many times. Oh, yeah. And I love, I love that they're like, that Vincent Price is like, can we do something about food and not just me being scary? And they're like, <laughs> sure. That was a very gracious thing that the Muppet Show did in that, in that largely non-funny sketch. But uh, at least he got to talk about yeah. food. Yeah. And he did, he does relish saying words like haute cuisine. Haute cuisine. <laughs> yeah. And you just relished saying relish. I did. Nice. Relished it. I'll tell you what I relished saying from this episode. Um, we, we were talking a little bit about this the other night, how there are moments in your life, there are moments from the Muppet show that stick with you and for some reason become a part of who you are. This episode in particular had one of those for me. Uh, there is a moment where, um, Vincent Price, uh, it's midnight. And he knows that at midnight he is going to turn into a terrible creature. And he, his line is, he says, chains, manacles, bind me. And then he ducks and disappears and then comes up as a monster who happens to just be a, a it's a one off bit where he's playing an orchestra conductor. But as a child, that brief line, I used to terrorize my kid's sister by going, chains, manacles, 
bind me! And then I'd duck behind the couch or a chair or whatever the furniture was. And then I would come up as a monster and scare my sister. Oh. So as a little kid, that that seeing that again and watching it this gave episode, you a line. Now the fun thing oh. is that the the American version of that show, mm-hmm. the punchline was that he comes out and he's Guy Lombardo, uh, who was well known for the new. Year. It was the one day of the year that he would uh, come out, and and Guy Lombardo was. Well known Craig, for conducting. I don't even know who Guy Lombardo is. Everyone, you know, is there anyone here? <laughs> is there anyone here who does we're, we're know? Like, well, remember Beverly Sills, you guys. No, come on, <laughs> well, give me more. Is there anybody here who knows Guy Lombardo? I see some people. Guy Lombardo uh, conducted yeah, guess the. What? Uh, there are some old dudes in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> what Spoiler alert. Um, Guy Lombardo was known for conducting the New Year's Eve uh, thing on television. Okay. He okay. was he was the Dick Clark of his time. Oh, okay. Before right. there was New Year's Rock and Eve, there was New Year's there Slow was Eve. Guy Lombardo's yeah. <laughs> somnolent <Yes>. Eve. <laughs> um, and uh, but in the UK where this was made, they knew nothing from Guy Lombardo. Yeah, there's like a bunch of me. So they used the name Jack Parnell, who was very well known orchestra conductor, who happened to be the orchestra conductor for the Muppet Show. Oh, okay. So now we use uh, the 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 UK versions of the Muppet Shows, which are two minutes longer, have become the new masters. Those are the standards. Those are the standards right. now, because the show was two minutes longer in in England than it was in America. So because now, of lack of advertising, exactly, presumably. exactly. So what's in those two extra two minutes, bunch of filler. They would do it. No, actually, a two, uh, they would do uh, usually a two Not minute ads. No, those a, are awesome. A two minute musical number usually. Wasn't so, I'm looking through you the I UK think so. number yeah. from this episode I with think the so, ghosts? Yeah. Oh, um, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there are some very beautiful uh, UK spots and a lot of things that were done like English music hall songs. And, right, which was uh, a big. That felt like it was very much a part of the DNA of season one. Right, because mm-hmm. the show was produced in England, and the obviously the whole. The whole setup of the Muppet Show is that it is a kind of vaudeville music hall show. Right. So the the upshot of that is that the name that Vincent Price says in this is now a name that no one knows on either coast on either country. Right. But the, you, the the direct the conductor's name is what again? Jack Parnell. Already forgot it again. See, yeah. There, yeah, you yeah go. there you go. <laughs> what was it again? Jack Parnell. Great. Did you keep that in your head? Nope. I already I forgot. Uh, I have a I have a question for Craig. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Craig, it's me, John Hodgman. <laughs> yes, John. <laughs> there is a Muppet. Uh, in this episode, who's a very famous uh, pre pre Muppet Show Muppet, who plays the, the the creepy Muppet who says, "I'm the beautiful assistant." Uncle Deadly. Uncle Deadly. Yes. Yeah. Now tell me a little bit about that that Muppet because that Muppet always scared me. Well, uh, Uncle Deadly uh, came about in the first season, and he was the the big uh, bit that he was used in was a, an episode where he was the Phantom of the Muppet Theater. And that was, uh, that's a great gag. Yeah. And, uh, but what's fun is that that character made a return in the TV show that came out a couple of years ago where he became Miss Piggy's dresser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a great sort of turn for. For the Uncle Deadly character. Yeah. But I thought Uncle Deadly preceded the Muppet show. Uh, Karen Falk? Did, I don't, what? No. 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 So Karen Falk, our archivist in the audience, is, All right. uh, no. Thank you, Karen. We're going to get so up. much there, wrong. There have been, I, I, think, <laughs> um, Karen? I think there was confusion. There was Lothar, uh, who preceded mm-hmm. uh, the Muppet Show. He was in Great Santa Claus Switch and some other thing. And there's some similarity between Uncle Deadly and Lothar. I'm going to use my phone to look up Lothar while you guys talk about another thing. Yeah. Oh. I, uh, <laughs> I want to say two things I, that I love in this episode that stand out. Number one is how as a host, how happy Vincent Price seems to be to be interacting with the Muppets. All all five of the hosts do a great job. Uh, they were guests. They weren't hosts. Well, Kermit guests. is the host. Right. Ah. My mistake. You have ruined our show, Hal. Can I check with Karen on that? Yeah. Uh, all of these guests interact well with the Muppets, but he in particular seems to have a lot of joy and, and sort of relish everything he does with them. Uh, so that that's one thing that stood out. The other is that opening number, I've got you under my skin, mm-hmm. where the where the Muppet has devoured the other Muppet who keeps popping up through his shoulder, out of his mouth. Uh, I, I think that M- Muppeteering and puppeteering in general is like a magic trick in that when it's done, it just – everything sort of fades away and you're left in wonder. And that number in particular has so many different – versions there's a muppet inside a muppet then that muppet is shooting water out of his mouth uh coming in through the shoulder popping out Mm -hmm. and being thrown back in i just love how complex that feels and how well it's pulled off and then he spends the rest of the i'm sorry you go uh he spends the rest of the episode 
uh, completely traumatized when he's backstage yes. from having been swallowed by this Muppet during the opening number. So you just periodically see him just shaking yes. through the background like, oh, oh, oh. The backstage continuity is of the, the shows is what makes it come alive. Oh, yeah. Like the fact that you are seeing the, the performers on stage mm-hmm. and then you're seeing them reacting to what happened off stage in exactly the same way. Yeah. Even a Muppet that has no name so far as we know. Yeah, just um, the scared, traumatized. Yeah, was, but I was, I was going to say, how Lublin, you have just defined the two criteria by which I came to judge the best of these five. Oh. <laughs> Guest interaction with Muppets and moment of absolute wonder. That's a tease for my decision later on. <laughs> <laughs> I was under the impression that we were going to make a decision. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll make a decision. Right, and then we'll see if it's right. Yeah, and on. if it's a different one, whoever wants to see that episode will go out and, and you you can show it to them on an iPad. Sure. <laughs> and we'll, we'll watch the other one here. Um, about this magic, uh, the, this magic wonder moment, uh, there was another great one in this episode for me, which is, uh, the, it's, uh, Muppet News Flash, the, it's the, um, that, uh, furniture is turning into monsters and coming alive and attacking people. And the way that the furniture comes to life, it's a, uh, a, a Muppet watching this on the news, and the furniture in his home just starts coming to life. And the magic of seeing that happen, a piece that you thought was a set piece, suddenly teeth flip down and eyes flip up. And it's re- it's one of those really cool, like, puppetry wizardry moments. Um, do we have anything else we want to talk about on this episode until we move on? No, I think one it- little comment to say. Please. Yeah. Make a note. Mm-hmm. The may I lend you a hand gag. Put a pin in that. We're going to talk about that later. Great. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, this is also a show where you get to see a lot of the season one things that sort of end up going way later on, like at the dance and the little talk show I bit. I love the at the dance. Yeah. In general, I love that bit because it's just an, it's it a was, bunch of two line jokes. Well, it was very much a take on, on Laffin's mm-hmm. uh, cocktail party. The whole idea of this thing going on and just breaking in for these little bad jokes uh, constantly. There you go. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to our second, uh, our second episode that is in the running. We're doing all of these chronologically again. Yes. So this is from season two, airing in October. Your guest, John Cleese. Mmm. Fifteen seconds to curtain, Mr. Cleese. <laughs> well, it's no use struggling, Mr. Cleese. You can't leave until you've done the show. Come it, I don't do old show tune. Come it, this place is infested with pigs. Wagnerian opera? Oh, oh. No, I'd have hated your lousy good end. I only work with the frog. That's you, right? No, check. Uh, the bear and the ugly, disgusting little one who catches cannonball. He caught the cannonball! Which one are you? I'm the ugly, disgusting one who catches cannonball. Ah, oh, yes. Come it, I am your guest! This is your guest! You call a vessel! Together. He's so good, indeed. Uh, I this one felt to me like the Muppet Show writers were huge John Cleese fans. And they were given a toy for Christmas, and they wanted to play with it. Is that was that's pretty much it? Yeah. yeah I mean, um, you know, the show, the the Muppet Show, would always take the form of whatever host was uh, yes. a guest. 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 I did that on purpose yeah. to see if anybody <laughs> would correct it. Um, the guests would come in. They would meet with the writers. They would uh, talk to the uh, Jim beforehand, and it was always about getting a chance to do something they don't normally do. Mm-hmm. In most cases except for Milton Berle, who only wanted to do everything he's always done before. Um, but, you know, Beverly Sills tap danced. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the whole idea of John Cleese doing a musical number was something that they wanted to play with. So it was basically, um, you know, some weeks it would be a very musical show with the guests, and some weeks it would just be a lot of sketches. And, um, you know, the, they would just mold the show around the guest. Now, here in this episode, this what season is this from? Season two. Season two. So what I noticed in the transition from season one to season two, and obviously this wasn't the first example of it, but in our 
five shows. This is the first example of the scooter coming to alert the guest that he's got or she's got five minutes. Which is or, or 15 time. seconds or 30 seconds. <laughs> right, or yeah. whatever or it is. Right. One second. Like, right. It's, so that was not in the Vincent Price episode. I don't know when that they that changed bit opening. Was uh, they changed openings. The first yeah. season had a different opening uh, number. Thing. The full opening and number was completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And then uh, they just started the cold open with Scooter in season two, three, and four. And I think season five they moved to Pops. Oh, who was uh, the, the stage the, doorman? The stage doorman. Why did they make that change? I think they were just Scooter introducing. Wanted too much money. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> they, they, they brought in another character for Jerry Nelson, mm-hmm. and uh, the idea of just sort of mixing things up. But. Right. Well, that but that Scooter cold open gag was one of the greatest inventions of the, of the oh, yeah. series. I felt, and it also sets the tone for the episode that you're going to see. Right? Exactly. Well, it sets up the theme, yeah. and the theme in this one is that John Cleese doesn't want to be there. Which and did feel weird about this across. episode. <laughs> What's it, that? It's great acting, but it's such. It felt like such. I'm a not sure he was always. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> it's John Cleese is a jerk to the Muppets for this whole episode. But that I was sort of that, that was sort of the that. John Cleese character of the yeah, time. Yeah. You know, he's basically the it's the faulty towers sure. John Cleese who just you know it, everything annoys him. Right. It's it's fun to see that because. Uh, everyone in, in a lot of these, like in the Vincent Price episode, you see how much joy he's having with the Muppets all around him and like, oh, this is wonderful. And even looking over the, uh, looking over his contract with Kermit, John Cleese is like, I don't care that you're a Muppet. I'm going to look at this. I don't like you. You don't like me. We're, look, we're, it's, it feels very much like just a dude talking to a dude who doesn't like him. I love John Cleese and I appreciate that he was probably just acting. But I'm going to tip my hand. This is not my favorite episode of the five, <laughs> for the reason that I it, it was so the, his attitude, the character that John Cleese was portraying was so poisonous. I just found it to be like, Ugh, let's move on. I do like the payoff at the end where they keep putting him in the different musical numbers. Yeah, that, that was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. and like, then John but, Cleese hates this. We're gonna really make him hate. But it. I, I think <laughs> that's sort of the pushback. You know, yeah. John Cleese spends the whole episode pushing at the Muppets, and they're pushing back. Finally. Yeah. Although it does ultimately end with him trying to choke the life out of Kermit and murder him. Yeah. On television. Yeah. <laughs> he may have just want that out there. <laughs> just so we realize what's happening. And it, also the Vincent Price episode, which we'll talk about a little. There's a lot of Muppet on Muppet crime. <laughs> Yeah. In that episode, and then this one is a ton of like. Well, it was a different time. Pal. <laughs> sure, <laughs> it was the seventies. People were choking Muppets on television. That's just how it was. Uh, is there anything else we want to point out in this episode in particular? Before, but we'll we'll, we'll come back to it and discuss it in more detail. Uh, also, well, pig, uh, pigs in space. Yeah, season yeah. two. Yeah, the pigs in space. Uh, uh, season two is the first time we see pigs in space. Ah. Uh-huh. And uh, that's all I can say about it. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have any insight into how John Cleese felt about being on The Muppet Show? Oh, uh, he had a great time because he also did The Great Muppet Caper. I mean, and and, um, he was, uh, you know, it was something that even though he's saying he doesn't want to be there, uh, it it was a bit. Well, that is reassuring to me because it was very convincing. (laughs) (laughs) And I felt... And I have to say, the Muppets pushing back in that way, that was a different look for them, too. You don't see yeah. Kermit getting aggro in that way, like yeah. very passive-aggressive, like, I'm going to make you sing something you don't want to sing. Well, it was a weird, it it was a weird tension that that, yeah. that, that that felt a little off to me, personally. That's yeah. just my take. Uh, uh, you want to move on to yeah, our or, third episode? Uh, this is also from the second season, uh, and also one where something seems slightly amiss from a normal episode. This is Steve Martin. Fifteen seconds till curtain, Mr. Martin. (laughs) See, you're going to feel right at home around here. Tonight's show has been canceled. Have I died and gone to heaven? Heard this rumor that the uh, show had been canceled. Uh, Well, yeah, you see, we have to audition new acts tonight. We got some really great talent lined up, boss. I am so funny. This great new act for you, Dancing Cheese. Old man. Ribbit. <laughs> what chance does a bear have? Maybe I could just, you know, perform for the guys. This guy's good. Oh, really? Puppy dog. <laughs> good stuff. I've killed him. Well, I'm ramming, 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 ramming. Well, that was different. Yep, lousy, but, but different. different. <laughs> now, 
Mark, you mentioned yeah. uh, a thing from The Muppet Show really stuck with you as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I remember this one distinctly. Because seeing, yeah. seeing the phony back wall of the theater made the whole show feel so much more real. Obviously, yeah. it was a phony, like that brick wall with the, with the uh, spotlights disused and the idea none of, of it was real I just yeah no no i know, <laughs> yeah. I, I know. but I, actually i, I guess one was, thing was more was my, phony than others this was but. my first, but this was i think my first introduction to the concept of meta that they were going yeah. to take this phony show and pretend that it's real and that they were now going to cancel the fake show to have a, a even faker fake show and the beauty like the beauty of it wasn't even a, a look so much as it was the sound that they because the regular audience of of Muppets who were never really there weren't mm -hmm. there, were replaced now by the main cast. You know, who were, weren't didn't even fill up the theater. The whole uh, laugh track was different. It was just yeah. the performers, and it was like five people laughing instead of fifty people laughing, which is fascinating incredible. to listen to yeah. in yeah. this episode. And it, has, it makes it feel incredibly intimate, incredibly mm -hmm. real. To me, this is the first episode of the five where the characters are really alive. Yeah. In a way that you do not doubt for a second. Not that the first two episodes weren't, you know, they're magical performances in there, but this is one where it's like, Fozzie Bear is really afraid for his job on this yeah. show. Yeah. And the other last thing I'll say about it is that you get to see Steve Martin's stand up routine from this era because he's just doing stuff that he was doing on the road. The yeah. Ramblin' guy mm -hmm. and the, and the, uh, the balloon animals. animals and everything else. That was all from his act. And his act, you know, Steve Martin. You know, his act was profoundly anti-comedy. Mm -hmm. Like, he was as talented in many ways as Andy Kaufman, just much straighter looking. Yeah. And he was doing weird stuff like, I'm just going to play the banjo and pronounce words wrong. <laughs> it's just so, and to me, like, that, that comedy meshed so beautifully with the Muppets because by the time you're getting to this, the, these episodes, the whole thing of like, can you lend me a hand? Here's a hand. Like, that's a good corny joke. That's part mm -hmm. of the DNA of the Muppet Show. But eventually it just became seeing your friends talk to each other and saying funny things because that's Fozzie Bear. Fozzie Bear's afraid of losing his job. Yeah, that's yeah. The, that's I, the joke. I think what happens here is that the, the show's format is sort of solidified now. So the writers and Jim and Frank, they felt comfortable having fun with it. And right. they could depart from it once they know what it is. So uh, the show would continue to do really weird episodes you know, they did you know an episode with, that was an entire dance marathon right. that you know it's taking place during the show and every but everything is is part of the dance marathon they've done they did murder mysteries they did an alice in wonderland show that was all that whole story so the idea that you know they can really depart from the norm and and just do something really meta as you said is a lot of fun and even though it was only getting faker and faker and faker it enhanced the reality of the world of the show and those characters to me. Yeah, that's when I believe. Yeah. That's when I believe they all had feet in right. a real the, way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, that's yeah. A, a really good point you made, John. I know. I, I only make the good ones, <laughs> <laughs> but it was something I hadn't considered uh, in watching it. Was the amount of world building that went on? Not necessarily that a bunch of new characters were brought in, but how three dimensional your the main characters became. Whether it's Fozzie fearing for his job or just hearing him in the audience throw out a <laughs> suggestion or yeah. give some feedback. Right. Like yeah. that's like, oh, he's really when the cameras stop rolling, Fozzie's still Fozzie and he's out there. Like it really helps suspend the disbelief further. Plus the the Stadler and Waldorf Vaudeville Stadler and Waldorf auditioning for the show that they hate. That's yeah. Right. Oh, you saw it in the oh. clip. It's it's just Stadler and Waldorf doing an actual old timey number, which is introduced by Sam the Eagle coming out into the crowd saying, you know, thank goodness something wholesome is coming up here right now. Yeah. Right. And, of course, the next act is lunacy. Uh, uh, but I wanted to touch on what you mentioned about Steve Martin and his doing just doing his stand-up yeah. act in this. There's something that felt, and I, that was the nature of his stand-up act, was that it was unsettling. He never had punchlines. He just built up tension and never released it. But there's there was something about this that felt odd to me because... Steve Martin's stand-up act was designed to be done in front of an audience of normal people and where he is the weirdo. Right. Um, and for him to be doing it for a group of weirdos, weirdos that are like, this is a great act. This is a totally normal act <laughs> yeah. we're watching. Was yeah. really weird yeah. and unsettling. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, well, Scooter says at the beginning, you'll fit right in. Yeah. And, you know, Steve Martin's whole shtick was – he looked like a middle manager who put on a goofy arrow mm -hmm. through his head and did insane things. Yeah, and never fit. Right he was in. a Muppet in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. He was, yeah. He, they should have given him the job. 
<laughs> yes. And some of the some of the Muppets that came in and auditioned were great. The one thing I oh. I don't like about this episode is we did not get nearly enough Miss Piggy, but we got Miss Piggy in the right moment. Um, when you see that hook uh, pulling off the um, pulling off the the uh, young the young girl who keeps auditioning with that frog. Yeah. And every time she auditions like three times, and she changes her name each time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> such a beautiful little note. Like I don't remember. Do you remember the name of that? It's Mary Louise and Terry Louise. Yeah, it's like Mary Louise and then it's Terry Louise and then it's Carrie Louise. And the joke is, she sings a song, and any time there's any word in it, it sounds like. R- r- ribbit, the even remotely goes, like yeah. Ribbit. Yeah, so it's old man Ribbit, <laughs> yeah, just the fun, <laughs> the dumbest, funniest. And no one ever ever. wonders why that frog can only say Ribbit, but Kermit can talk Norman. Yeah, I mean it's a I guess a different frog. It's a different, di- well, but he's part of the act. Yeah, you should have yeah. we should have seen him backstage. Right. It was the seventies. He could have been smoking a cigarette, going, "I got to get out of this game." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same agent as John Cleese. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. Um, uh, right. And then at the end, but to finish that at the end, you see that it's Miss Piggy that's been pulling her off with the cane every time, and she's up in her face, going, "I'm the only girl singer on this show," <laughs> uh, which is a great, like, it's a great little button to that one, two, three punch. Uh, do we want to talk? Do we have anything else on this uh, Steve Martin episode? I think we can move on. Great. Uh, this is from season three. This episode uh, uh, is just celebrated its 40th birthday. All right. Your guest, Harry Belafonte. It's the Muppet Show with our very special guest star, Harry Belafonte. Rough eat and eat. <laughs> Leggies and jungle funds? <laughs> Leggies and jungle funds. All right, so my typing is bad. <laughs> there really isn't any difference in any of us if we were to take time out to understand each other. Exactly as we were before. Gentlemen. What? <laughs> uh, I have something to say about this. I think, yeah, me too. But please want, go ahead. What do you want to say? Well, all right. So that closing number yeah. is like just goosebumps yeah. all over every yeah. time. And I've seen it now five times in the past day. Yeah. Yep. You know what I mean? And in terms of believing that they have feet, when he's doing that closing number with those, uh, those, those uh, African mask uh, Muppets, mm-hmm. and then the rest of the cast walk out on stage. You believe they're walking out on... Not only do you believe they're walking out on stage, but you believe they're walking out on stage because they just can't... Th- this song is so great, they yeah. have to be in on it. It, it yeah. felt like they organically yeah. decided to... You yeah. know what, guys? Let's all be part of this. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, hey, right? And, and it, obviously, it's not that at all, so... And they keep singing it through the credits. I mean, they have... Right. Yeah. There's a little horn version of the Muppet Show theme that comes in, but basically, they keep singing uh, Turn the World Around throughout and, the entire... Right, uh, they credits. don't do the, the normal yeah. credit sequence. And Statler and Waldorf are singing, too. Yeah. Even they get in on it. <laughs> and that, there's something about this episode that I love is that all of the – everything is so simple in this episode. All the moments in this episode, like, it's – we're just going to have Harry Belafonte and Animal do a drum battle. That we're, is an amazing thing because, yeah. you know, this is another point where at this point these characters are wholly real creatures. Yeah. There is not a moment that you do not believe Animal mm-hmm. is not drumming. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong. That puppet is not drumming. No, <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I never, I never knew for sure. That that, that puppet is uh, incredibly not drumming. Right. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure. So not only is this a testament to the amazing puppeteering of who uh, Frank Oz, Frank Oz, and, and uh, whoever was doing Frank's hands. Right, and you know, you all like you always believe that animal is drumming, but at the end of that drum battle, they both collapse. An exhaustion, and you believe that animal is exhausted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it has absolutely no dialogue. There is no, lend me a hand. Here you go. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's character work. And Harry Belafonte, of course, 
has to be playing against well, I mean, what is he he's actually drumming. Yeah. But what's he playing what's he playing against? Is it, did they have a drummer in there was in the someone studio? live probably yeah, uh, right. doing it. Uh Harry Belafonte, what's what's really wonderful is that um he re- enjoyed this as much as we enjoyed this, this whole process. I had gotten the pleasure to talk to him about it, and he's been on some panels that we've done down at in uh, at the Silver Theater in Maryland. And um he just loved this experience. You can and, tell. Yeah. yeah. And um in turn in the goosebump department, uh Harry sang that song, Turn the World Around, at Jim's memorial service sure. in New York City. And you're talking about five thousand people in uh Saint John the Divine. Uh and it was just it it, it was just incredible. It I was an incredible yeah. experience. And um it was a very important thing for for Harry and um you know, it, it just, it, it was an incredible thing. And what's wonderful about Harry is that he is willing to play around with the facts if it will make things funnier. Because, uh, in example, this, Craig. I will, example. I'm about to give you an example. <laughs> um, when they are getting ready to do the banana boat song, Dale, yep. um, Fozzie says, you've performed this sh- on television many times. And, and Harry, Harry says, says no. no, this is the first time. And I asked him that, that you had performed this on TV before. And he's like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, he's you know, a lot of times. Yeah. But sold. it's funnier if Fozzie is ruining the first performance right. on television of the Ben Adavote song. And the back and as forth. As opposed to the hundredth. You know? Right, exactly. And when yeah. Fozzie says, we're going to make it great, trust me. Yeah. And he says, trust me several times. And then when Harry Belafonte says, trust me to Fozzie, I've never seen a rapport between a a man and a Muppet before like that. <laughs> this Fozzie in this, uh, Harry Belafonte is the guest. Fozzie is the, uh, MVP of this episode though. In this episode, Fozzie is playing the writer. He's decided that he's going to start writing the Muppet show, which is why at the beginning Kermit has pages with him. And it's like, which also is a great intro to Fozzie in this episode because, uh, you see Kermit with pages and he's like, what is, and uh, before he's come on stage, the first thing you hear is Fozzie in the back going, just read it, Frog. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that to me was such a wonderful bit. I love yeah. a good offstage bit. Yeah, um, and and Kermit is and Fozzie's a terrible typist, and it's full of so he's like ladies yeah. and Jekyllfins, and he says, "I'm Kermit the Forg." And you can just see yeah. like the 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 <laughs> look of indignation on Kermit's <laughs> face that Jim Hansen was able to manipulate through his hand, just like. What the hell is going on? <laughs> you know, uh, Fozzie's a bear. A four. You know, Fozzie's a bear using a human typewriter. It's not his fault. Yeah. Sure. yeah. The world yeah. is stacked against him. Yeah, no, yeah. He's I a, in a, the human I world. I understand. But that, to me, that was, so, and that's just a layer underneath some of these incredible yeah. performances. Another thing to, you know, I, I wrote down some of the, the sketches in each show and the Harry Belafonte show only has seven elements in it. And, and most of the Muppet shows have like 12 different things or, or more mm-hmm. there's a lot of going on but it never feels like it's slow or you know that they're that's 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 slowly paced and quick question that that uh ralph and new zealand singing t for two backwards is that one of those two minute add-ons yeah i believe so because I, I it uh, felt weird it felt eat, like an add-on in it's, episode. Right. yeah i think it's yeah. either it's, it's well, genius it's either that or the muppet sports thing might be the two minute oh okay it, it, I, we'd have to look oh at the, the, the um Blindfolded, blindfolded, yeah, the the blindfolded race. race, yeah. yeah. And um, the, the 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 entire writing framework with Fozzie Bear is so great in that it gives us a bunch of really great bits, including his scarf getting caught in the typewriter. Yeah, somebody talking about him being stuck. But it also, it all of it serves to set up that closing number because mm-hmm. it's all about telling stories. So he gives. Then you have Harry Belafonte, which we saw a clip of there telling them up. It's the story behind Turn the World Around, and that, so then when you see it done, it just all. The way that episode flows, and maybe it, maybe, it, maybe it's because it has fewer elements than than a regular episode would have had. Mm-hmm. It just feels like an overall narrative, unlike and some of the exactly. other. Exactly, and you know, it, it, John Cleese might have been doing a great acting job of pretending he didn't want to be there, but you do not feel that Harry Belafonte is acting in when he explains, "I'm happy to be here." Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yes. from the beginning, like he's like he'll make the. The lie that this is the first time he's done it on television in order to make that performance more special and to share it with them. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the closing number, you know, uh, uh, turn the world around is all about, do you know who I am? Do I know who you are? Let's 
share together. Uh, and that thematically plays off so beautifully yeah. in that. And it, and it gives a depth to the Muppets that had always been there that you didn't think about, which is all of these different creatures that all right. work together. And think of how many kids were watching this for the first time who were not, you know, who, who were he- hearing, uh, you know, African polyrhythms yeah. and, cons- and considering folk songs from Guinea. And seeing Harry Belafonte play play the drums, and seeing those meticulously researched, as far as I understand it, African masks who are not the characters they're used to seeing, like that's an incredible thing for Harry Belafonte to show them up at shows. Those shows. masks and that ending is felt to me like such a love letter to puppetry. Like it was the Henson people. It's a love letter to humanity. Well, yes. yes. <laughs> well, I mean, the song was a love letter to humanity. The puppets, in particular, <laughs> wow. John Osmond has oh, turned away sake. from Mark Agliardi. He, it, what? You know what? Our, our, this, this is so funny. Funny. You wouldn't I'm have the time, too. Ken. I turned away. All right, let's watch Your the last of one. We're turn, turning off turn the chair around. All right, this is our final, uh, our final episode we're looking at today. Our final episode from season four, coming out months before the film was released. It's Star Wars. <gasps> Seems we've landed on some sort of comedy variety show planet. Our guest star was scheduled to be Angus McGonagall, the Argyle Gargoyle, but we have canceled him. Well, you know, as long as the three of you are here, how about you go out on stage and do a song for us? <laughs> well, look, your little garbage can friend wants to. Listen, pal, we're on a mission. There's no way we're going to be involved in any third-rate variety show. Second-rate variety show. Ladies and gentlemen... Mark Hamill. You can be the guest on this very show, right, Kermit? Oh, well, uh, maybe. Uh, what do you do, Mark? Oh, oh, oh. oh well, you know, I've been uh, known to do impressions. Hey! Uh-huh. Who do you do? When you wish upon a Who's your tailor? I love that outfit. Dirt Mayer! Who? Isn't that Luke Skywalker terrific? Yay! <laughs> this episode is insane, and this episode is this episode is I, the first time I saw this episode was here uh, in this room uh, when you showed it uh, previously. And all I remember watching this episode is every moment in this is a what in the <laughs> world am I watching? All the way up to an incredibly bizarre finale. That foreshadows both Star Wars and the Muppets eventually being owned by Disney as they sing When You Wish Upon a Star. <laughs> <laughs> I've turned back around to you. That is. <laughs> I'm now facing directly towards you. That is. It, this amazing. is an insane it's an amazing episode. insight. Hey, I have a question. Yeah. When did this come out? This, was, this I didn't came out it. in February of 1980. It was before Empire Strikes. So it was before Empire. Yes, yeah, so I think right. okay. this actually the is Dagobah the fatigue yeah. before the film was released. This, I believe, marks the first time that uh, Luke's Bespin fatigues have been seen publicly. I was going to say because I, I got confused for a minute. I thought you were saying this came out before Star Wars, which would have been very confusing to the yeah. audience. <laughs> <laughs> the was from 1971. Why is that Oscar dancing? Yeah. <laughs> um, Jim Henson and George Lucas became good friends, and uh, they went on to do Labyrinth together. But what's uh, interesting about this is that the Muppet Show was shot in Elstree Studio, sure. uh, uh, the ATV. Studios, which is right across the street from the EMI Elstree studio where Star Wars was shot. Right. So there was a lot of going back and forth. And at this time, uh, you know, Frank Oz was going to do Yoda and Empire Strikes Back. And, um, the people in Jim's shop worked with the people, uh, in George Lucas's, uh, shop to help Yoda come about. I didn't know about Jim Henson's friendship with George Lucas. And it makes me wonder when George Lucas hired Frank Oz to do Yoda was Jim Henson like, hey, wait a minute. I believe, no, I believe he asked Jim first. Karen? Uh, yeah. Jim, Jim was asked first. He felt that Frank would do it better. Wow. All right. (laughs) Oh, Yoda the Jedi. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, he did a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, what else do we, we, this is, this episode is very much insane. So break it, break it down. Yeah. Who here has seen this whole episode? I th- so I th- most most people, but what happens is Luke Skywalker and C three PO and R two D two and Chewbacca the Wookiee they always refer to him as Chewbacca the Wookiee for some reason in this yeah. episode are get teleported into the theater 
they they co-opt them into being on the show. Right. But also Mark Hamill shows up separately. Yes. yes. <laughs> and they do a, a run around like uh, Mark Hamill runs in and then he leaves and Luke Skywalker runs in. It's his cousin. That's right. It's yeah. his cousin. Mark Hamill is uh, so Skywalker's cousin. The, the thing cousin. is that Chewbacca is there, not there at first. They're, fu- tr- they're looking for Chewbacca. Oh, they're right. looking for Chewbacca. Yeah. Right. Because Life Day is coming up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and and take, also take they uh, they uh, they go to pig they go to pigs in space and just uh, hijack their ship. Sure. Right. So I didn't know in watching this episode, I didn't know what took place in the Muppet Theater. Was pigs in space a sketch, or are they actually going to outer space? Like you know, well, I mean? like, I, you might be digging one layer that, too that, deep. Yeah, I, think I, am. <laughs> I think I'm digging pigs a in layer space deep. within the reality of the Muppet Show. Yeah. Pigs in space was a sketch that right. was on the stage, which is why and I was Mark confused. Hamill. I mean, Luke Skywalker. Did not realize he was on a stage. Yes. Right. That's what was But happening. his cousin Mark Hamill did. Yeah. And absolutely. And you know what? Mark, his cousin Mark Hamill, uh, what a show person. Yeah. Well, that guy, yeah. That guy really did. And also, Mark had a great time doing this. He you actually he tweeted uh, uh, at us uh, at about this event. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He said he was honored to be included, and uh, it was uh, hashtag uh, gargling Gershwin guy. His enjoyment of doing the gargling Gershwin bit on the show, because yeah. they were originally going to book. Angus McGonagall. Angus McGonagall, who gargles Gershwin. <laughs> the gargoyle, the gargling gargoyle. Yeah. Argyle gargoyle. And, and, and the Mark Hamill decides to join him on stage, and his enjoyment at gargling Gershwin is frankly embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, the song that they chose was Summertime from Porgy and Bess, <laughs> which is to hear that song sped up and gargled by Luke Skywalker and a Muppet gargoyle while they're doing this. All right. I don't know that you've heard or read Porgy and Beth. I think at this point we're off to the races. There are some problems with this episode. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. It's funny you mentioned Life Day because the latter half of the episode feels like the Star Wars holiday special. Mm-hmm. And, and my memory as a child of that episode was it being my favorite in the whole world because what did I love more than Star Wars? Nothing. But the Muppets were a close second so seeing them together it was like well this is it will never get better than this Mm -hmm. it did yeah it had (laughs) okay didn't realize it are we at the point now uh since we have gone and talked since we have talked about all of these episodes let me ask a question you guys because i have a hunch in just in discussing this when we all turned around after watching the clip from the harry belafonte episode there was a moment of pause when no one talked do you remember my two criteria? Yes. Interaction with the guest and the Muppets and moment of wonder. Yes. Um, did no one want to talk because we all turned around and went, well, this is clearly the best half hour of television ever made and uh, nothing's going to beat this and we still have to talk about another episode after this? Because that was kind of what went yes. through my head. Yes. Okay. I was just checking. Um, Do you want to know what Frank said yet? Or? Yeah. Of course. Of course. Vincent Price. <laughs> <laughs> Milton Burrow. Uh, <laughs> um, Frank said that by his recollection, he thought the best show was Harry Belafonte. Yeah. I'll take yeah. my dollar, Ken Plume. And this, up on stage. Uh, this, uh, you know, so as much as we sort of talk about the, um, the, the online poll being problematic, mm-hmm. Uh, it did select and include in the finalists, uh, you know, Frank's selection, and I think one of the the best episodes, uh, like you said, of, of television created. Um, the other four are certainly entertaining. Oh yeah, they're and all brilliant they're all in their blast. own way. Yeah. yeah, and they all do. They all have elements that uh, their version of is the best. Like, um, who is it? there's some, there's one that's uh, the best scooter opening. The best scooter opening isn't uh, Crazy Harry blowing up the room of these i look at it and i see john cleese tied up in a chair i see right. steve martin yep. just going okay i'm ready to go on ha huh! all right now i'm ready to go on like there are individual elements and i think that frank also you know he didn't go into great detail but it was very much uh, well, your meet, meeting your criteria he said that that harry really came to play we had a great time and it was very special he's interwoven into the into the episode in a way that uh, that I feel like John Cleese was not. Those sketches with Cleese were distinct from the overall arc. Maybe that's just because it was early. Vincent Price was used in a very on-the-nose way a lot of the time. Mm, right. 
Um, and also not a terribly Mark good Hamill. It was inc- it was incredibly interactive and wonderful and, and charming. And C three PO tap dance. Yeah, and C- I mean yes. it's, it's brilliant stuff. And but you know that's always going to be a, a category apart. It's, it's sort it's of a Star gimmick Wars. show. Yeah, it's, it's it's a gimmick it's, show. It is a great show. I don't think it's the best representative uh, episode of and Muppet Steve show. Martin is I think uh, formally extremely inventive and funny and enjoyable but ultimately a little cold because it's not a real sh- not a real show right. quote unquote and the harry belafonte one for me was just like this is as as funny as the muppets ever got as touching as the muppets ever got and spoke of i think what was the sort of the very gentle but and humane revolutionary mission of the muppets mm-hmm. which was to promote a kind of inclusivity that no matter how weird you were you had a part on that stage, yeah. and that the and that we need to know each other, and that was what I think what made the the break with the tradition of closing with the like the closing credits after that song was like burp, 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 burp. that was just so inappropriate. It was just like <laughs> this is this is the end of the show. Like so that that was why I knew from the beginning that you would all agree with my correct assessment that this is the best. <laughs> I I am relieved Muppet because I, we would have it would have been sad to sort of. Yeah. Be conflicted about yeah. that. If John, if you pulled out an envelope that said John Cleese on a piece of, on a tiny piece of paper. And I would like to get some credit for the people who are listening to the podcast don't realize this, but I am, I am wearing my Ernie shirt right now. This is my, <laughs> yes, it's uh, a good Ernie for my specific Muppet uh, shirt today. So. Excellent. Um, well, uh, as we always end our podcast, once we have uh, made our final decision, Hal? Two minutes, people of the world! Uh, the <laughs> greatest episode of The Muppet Show. <laughs> <laughs> Who threw something? Ken threw a dollar at you. The him. greatest episode <laughs> of The Muppet Show is the most representative episode of The Muppet Show. It's everything that The Muppet Show can be and should be encapsulated over the course of 22 to 24 minutes. Uh, it has humor. It has a great interaction with the guest and, and a moment that, that leaves you with wonder, not be, not only because of how well it's pulled off, because it actually makes you think uh, a little deeper than you might normally. So not only if you're not in this audience about to watch the screening with us, should you go seek this episode out, but you should learn more about Harry Belafonte and the work that he's done as an activist. Uh, you're here. Amen. The, 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 cause that's the other thing that is great about this episode. is it, I came away thinking, what more could I do to help make the world a better place? And I think that that's not only central to his message, but also central to the message of the Muppets in a way. So the greatest episode of the Muppet Show of all time is the show with Harry Belafonte as the guest, asked and answered. There you go. There you go. Um, there we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Before before we uh, launch into the episode, we'll uh, just do our, our traditional uh, credits and closing to the show. Thank you for having us here to do this. Thank you for suggesting this. Um, well, you're our... absolutely welcome. It was my pleasure. <laughs> it was his pleasure. I'm turning uh, my chair away from you. Craig, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the Henson Legacy and uh, where people should be looking online? And yes, and what uh, well, the Jim see? Henson Legacy, uh, jimhensonlegacy.org. Uh, also, uh, most of the stuff we're doing here, um, we do this every weekend. Uh, join the museum's uh, mailing list for details. Join the museum and get to see all of this stuff for for nothing. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. We have a uh, touring version of the Jim Henson exhibition that's in Seattle right now until the end of February. And uh, there is another permanent exhibition for listeners that were down in Atlanta at the Center for Puppetry Arts and uh, all of those things. And Amazing. And fantastic. Well, thank you. Uh, and John Hoffman. My book, Vacation Land, comes out <laughs> on the 24th. Well, depending on when you hear this podcast, you may either pre-order it or order it now by going to bit.ly slash uh, vacationland. All capital letters are going to your local bookstore. And my book, uh, The Muppets Character Encyclopedia, is available at, at places, too. But, and, which is fantastic, by the way. Yes. I, and, and I fully endorse that book. It's a great book. So uh, thank you. to. What about Craig? your books, guys? Yes. What? You, you want to plug your books? Uh, yeah. I wrote one anonymously called Beowulf. <laughs> They, um, they haven't written books. And my book, Mark Gagliardi Did Not Write Beowulf, is available now on Amazon. Uh, thank you, Craig, for joining us for the first time. And uh, John Hodgman for extending your record-breaking streak of appearances.
on the show. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here and tell you what's correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for this topic. Normally, we take our topics uh, from our listeners. So if you have a topic for us, you can email us at we got this podcast at gmail.com or go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash we got this podcast. Or you can reach out to us on Twitter at we got this tweets or check out the Maximum Fund subreddit. Many thanks to our musicians, Jonathan Dinerstein and Mike Furman, for our score and theme song, respectively. Thank you to producer Ken Plume sitting in the front row who helped put all of this together. Big Great, round of Ken. applause for Ken. Our researcher Kate McManus, Uri Kelman, the graphical designer, and QA engineer Jen Elba. And thank you, of course, as always, to you, our audience, uh, those of you who are listening right now, and those of you who are in this room right now um, watching this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For Hal Lublin, I'm Mark Gagliardi. For Mark Gagliardi, I'm Hal Lublin. And don't worry, everybody, we got this. We got this. Hey everyone, Freddie Wong, Matt Arnold, and Will Campos, here to tell you about Story Break, a writer's room podcast where every week we, the Hollywood geniuses behind Video Game High School, have one hour to turn a humble idea into an awesome movie. Thrill as we weave the tragic tale of Jar Jar, a Star Wars story. We're going to double down on everything that made the prequels great. Jar Jar, (laughs) trade federation, (laughs) politics. Gasp as we assemble a pantheon of heroes for the Kellogg Cinematic Universe. We could get rid of Snap, Crackle, Pop. I wouldn't even miss them. You're crazy. They die in the second Oh, come on! (laughs) And join us as we make fun of Matt as he struggles to name a single Beyonce song. Well, yeah, put a finger on it. Sure, she wants to be Beyonce. Put Um, a finger on it. Beyonce's (laughs) famous song. Will we break the story? Or will the story break us? Find out by joining us in the writer's room every Thursday on MaximumFun.org or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Hal Lublin. I'm Danielle Radford. I am Michael Eagle. And we are the hosts of Tights and Fights, Maximum Fun's newest podcast dedicated to all things wrestling. We'll be talking about Sasha Banks, the women's revolution, Sasha Banks, the brand split, and Sasha Banks' wigs. And we'll also be talking about wrestler fashion. Some wrestlers wear too many clothes. Some wrestlers don't wear enough clothes at all. And I'll be doing impressions of all your favorite wrestlers. New episodes Thursdays on Maximum Fun or wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, yeah, dig it. Tice and Bites Podcast. Tice and Bites. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Listener supported.